We're going over the seven most unstoppable commanders and their decks. I'm Mia, and I like the sound of mechanical keyboards. I'm BZ, and I'm still questioning why we have a shadow shelf. We're the nitpicking nerds. You can support us by going to Cool Stuff Inc. You might be saying, that's a card retailer or retailer online. What am I supposed to do? Use code NERDS when you check out to save 5% off your order, and it's our little way of telling them that we sent you. We're also sponsored by Dragon Shields, best sleeves in the multiverse. Good sleeves. If you go down in the description below, you can use our EU and US links to buy some sleeves and help the channel. We're also sponsored by Moxfield. There's an ad somewhere. You're not going to be able to guess where it is. Don't even try, but feel free to try. You will fail. And happy birthday to everyone whose birthday is today. So this is another in our... Entry, another entry in our seven most series. These are the seven most unstoppable commanders. When I say unstoppable, I mean they're impossible to keep off the board, or it's impossible to stop the deck that they're playing from enacting their game plan. These are very sticky commanders, and you just you don't want to kill them sometimes, or you can't kill them. They're either going to stay on the board for way longer than you'd like, or they're just going to keep coming back because they're really easy to recast. You'll see what we mean as soon as we get into it with the first one, Galta Primal Hunger. This is 10 green green for a 12-12, but this spell costs X less to cast, where X is the total power of creatures you control, and it has Trample, which is honestly huge. It is a 12-12. If you get hit twice with it, you are dead. I mean, this is the green stompy commander, and it doesn't matter if he gets killed three, four times times because you're going to have some big beefy boys on the field and he's just going to come back for two green mana every time. This deck is really crafty so even after board wipes they can easily rebuild and put Galta out for two mana after one or two board wipes because they find like cute mysterious little ways to like store power on the battlefield in ways that you can't really interact with. It's really cool. One of the cards you're going to see from this deck though that it's pretty important, it's Elvish Mystic. It's just all of the one mana dorks let this deck get ahead of everybody else. And not only are they one mana dorks, but they're an extra reduction in Galta and it's just like the perfect, like uh, uh, dorks were already some of the best rampant commander, but now it's like, oh, and your commander costs one less. Yeah, it's double dorks because it's like, oh, okay, tap it for mana. Okay, also reduction for mana. And the commander tax obviously doesn't matter if you're just putting out like power. It doesn't matter because it's just going to reduce it further. That's what helps Galta be so unstoppable is that you can't ever like kill it with combat. So you're going to have to throw removal spells at it, but the commander tax is reduced just like the regular cost of it. So if it costs 14 because it's taxed twice, doesn't matter. You can still cast it for green green if you have 14 power. <laughs> Topiary Stomper is another great creature in this deck. One green green for a 4-4 four, four. when it enters the battlefield. You put a basic into play tapped, and it can't attack or block unless you have seven lands, but that doesn't matter because you're putting four more power on the board for not even four mana, you know? Yeah, this isn't a card you see really anywhere else other than like dinosaur or typal decks, but Topiary Stomper, four power, so it's like a reduction of four, but it actually ramps you permanently, so you already get like a Wood Elves effect, plus Galta's just boop, that much cheaper. This next card I like a lot is Dodgy Jalopy, and it checks a lot of the boxes for this deck. It's two and a green for a star three vehicle with trample. It's an artifact, obviously, because it's a vehicle. Its power is equal to the highest mana value among creatures you control. It has crew three, and it's scavenged for two and a green, so there's like 17 mechanics on this card. But it, it, it in play, it's kind of a 0-3 if you have no other creatures. You play some creatures, you crew it, it automatically becomes a 3-3 bare minimum because it's a creature now. And then obviously when you get Galta out, which this helps do, then it becomes a friggin' 12-3 with Trample. And then in the graveyard, you can scavenge it if Galta's out for 12 counters. So even if the thing dies or trades off with its low toughness, you still create a huge board. And what vehicles do that are so special in the Galta deck is they store power on the board that are not creatures. So this is gonna sit and play. After a board wipe, you can play a 3-3, crew it, now you have six power instead of just the three. That's really awesome. And I love the fact that Trample is stapled on here. So you're just going to be chipping in damage. Even if they have a bunch of little one ones, two ones, doesn't matter. You're going to be swinging for a big chunk. Yeah, vehicles are really good in this deck. You're going to see other ones like Smuggler's Copter and like Cultivator's Caravan. But I wanted to touch on Dodge a lot because it even does the powers matter thing. One of my favorite lands for Galta is Treetop Village. And there's Taft, makes it green, but you pay two mana to turn it into a three, three Trample. Please don't ever attack with this unless they have no blockers and they're at three life. Don't even bother animating this. What it does is you animate it and now it reduces Galta by three. So if you were going to tap both of those lands for Galta, you would have made two mana. But you can tap two lands to make a three three and make him reduced by three. Super cool tech. Yeah, never 
actually attack with lands unless you're doing like the ink moth nexus you need to put a poison counter on someone but i do love the versatility that this has in the deck strictly better forest yeah you can do that with like mutal vault and there's some other ones too just super cool keep an eye out on the galta lands uh they're really they're really tricky they might make galta cheaper than you think what's next next is serac the hunt caller a 5-4 at the beginning of combat if your creatures have total power eight or more target creature gains haste that's gonna be really powerful if you like just play galta it's like all right give it haste swing in for that giant chunk yeah, it's pretty hard not to have Galta cost green green. You just played a five power creature and you're going to play Galta right after. Give it haste and then just clock somebody. It can kill people out of nowhere. Haste is pretty important for this deck since you're going to have no problem amassing power, but you don't want to have to keep passing the turn over and over to be susceptible to board wipes. You can rebuild, but it's not worth your time if you can just play these haste cards. You need just to hit as fast as possible because you don't have the utility of like counter spells and other things like that. I think this is part, part of what makes this deck so like unstoppable is that you just feel hopeless. You, you you have to kill Galta because it's huge. But they're just going to keep replaying it with haste. It's like every turn you need an answer. And you need to somehow also develop your own board. I mean, that commander damage is not going away either. Two hits. You're dead. Yeah, so just one full hit, you're like, oh no, even if I have blockers now, those twos and threes and even fives can just add up. Yeah, they really do. Life's Legacy is another one you're going to see. It's two mana, sack a creature, draw cards equal to its power. And we can replay Galta so easily that we're going to find paying two mana to draw 12 cards, then we'll just play two mana for Galta again. We can do the second main phase. And if you have any buffs or any counters to add to your creature, you can maybe even get even more cards. Yeah, Dodgy Jalopy can help scavenge onto something else and you can sacrifice it. It kind of makes the sacrifice part trivial because if Galta's just going to be recast, then it's really like pay four or draw 12. That's insane. That's not even a real rate. There's no card that does that. Overwhelming Stampede is another great one in this. You, your creatures get plus X, plus X, and Trample, where X is the biggest power among creatures you control. Like 12? <laughs> like like 12, perhaps, but the Trample is really what's going to just push it over the edge. Yeah, if you leave Galta in play for too long, and you try to press your luck with some instant speed removal or something, they might just throw out an Overwhelming Stampede, and you go, oh, I can kill Galta, but it's like, nope, they still get plus 6 for my other biggest creature, or my Dodgy Jalopy or something, and then you just go, crap. And this is like the deck's big you know, crescendo finisher, and you're just like, what was I supposed to do? Yeah, you have like 10 blockers, but it doesn't matter because they're swinging for like 70. <laughs> For unstoppable commanders, you knew there had to be an Eminence commander in here. And one of the most unstoppable ones is the Ur Dragon. Four and Wooburg for a 10 10. As long as it's in the command zone or on the battlefield, other dragon spells you cast cost one less to cast. Flying, whenever one or more dragons you control attack, draw that many cards, and then you could put a permanent card from your hand onto the battlefield. I love this because it doesn't say dragon from your hand on the battlefield. It just says any permanent. That's scary. Yeah, if you actually land the Ur Dragon, they're in a lot of trouble, but. That's the thing about the Ur Dragon is you talk about how do I stop the effect? How do I stop all of their dragons coming down? You literally cannot do that. You have to somehow strand the Ur Dragon on the battlefield with no abilities. That's the only way to stop that their dragons are going to cost one less and you're going to get beat down before you're going to have the chance to like defend or you're, they're going to you know double spell on a key turn and play a seven drop and a six drop, but they only spent that mana minus two. It's like, oh, it's such a key reduction and it will get you. I Sometimes I don't even think they'll put it out because I know at least with my Edgar deck, I don't play Edgar half the time because it's like, oh, why would I leave him vulnerable <laughs> to being trapped on the field when I can just keep him in the command zone and get that reduction anyways? Yeah, what's the strategy? Dragons. How do you stop it? You can't. You just have to hope that whatever draw you have is better than all of their reduced dragons. And they have other ways to reduce dragons, like Urza's Incubator, three mana, choose a type, cost two less. So now their dragons cost three less. I don't know what you're supposed to do when all their dragons are going to be five, six, seven mana. Dragon Temptus is another way to swing in for damage one or red for enchantment flyers get haste dragons deal x damage on when they enter the battlefield where x is the number of dragons you have they're just going to be spitting out dragons left and right and they're going to be dealing damage all over yeah and then the dragons will haste like you know the cycle of ancient dragons from Baldur's gate they'll do something wild when they hit you and now they have haste and they cost less so they're actually affordable like ancient copper on turn five after a dragon tempest on turn two could just be game over and that brings me to another thing about the era dragon is that they might not even have to cast it to get the attack trigger because they're going to use something like Hellkite Courser, which just throws Ur Dragon on the battlefield. He's like, what am I doing? I better attack. You smash him with all your stuff, draw some cards, throw out another big permanent, and then he just goes back to the command zone, ready for you to maybe cast him, but this deck doesn't really have to all the time. The four red red in this will not matter for the cost of Hellkite Courser because you're probably just going to put something just as big, if not bigger, in mana value down. So it's like, it's free. Also, it's only three red red. Because of the Ur Dragons. So oh, it's just like yeah. already a reduction. Next is Miram. It's a card that could have gone on this list 
in, in Unstoppable Commanders by itself, but we're going to put it here. The 6 mana 6-6 six, six, Flying Ward 2 and your dragons get copied when you play them, so now it's just complete utter chaos. If you play the Ur-Dragon after this, you end up with two, and then you get two attack triggers. It's not even fair. Miriam's crazy powerful. We have a Commander Cube, and I picked it, and it was so crazy, and I didn't even build a deck around it. I didn't pick it till last pack. And I won the game because it's that powerful. Yeah, even just the War 2 on a flyer can be annoying. It gets redu reduced by Ur-Dragon. Miriam's a must-kill, and Ur-Dragon has so many must-kills that you kind of run out of answers, and eventually you just get overwhelmed by whatever's left because it's all bombs. Like, Clouth, Unrivaled Ancient. If this thing attacks, you make, like, 300 trillion mana, and I don't know what you're supposed to do after that. You just have to stop it before it attacks, but that window is very small. You can only use it to cast spells, but that doesn't matter because you're going to just have more dragons and just spit them out onto the field. Yeah, it's like, oh, no, I can only use this 30 mana to cast spells. What a huge <laughs> downside. I was hoping to do something else. Kindred Discovery is another great one in this deck. Whenever that creature type that you pick enters the battlefield, you're going to draw a card. Of course you're going to pick dragons. And it works on attacks, so you just get like, oh, if I play some hasty dragon, I draw a card. Then it attacks, I draw a card. This card's really one of the, part of the like, overwhelming like snowball strategy of the Earth Dragon, where now all these dragons are drawing more dragons. So like, what can you do? Even if you wipe the board, they're going to start rebuilding with all the 13 other cards in their hand. And it just doesn't even matter. It's like a three mana dragon, sure. It was five mana dragon, all right, coming at you, haste, uh, attack trigger, combat damage trigger, old knob bones in here too, whatever. Oh, you're dead. I feel like keeping your handful is the biggest issue in this deck because you're so many dragons make mana, old knob bone, ancient copper, cloth. You're going to have enough mana, just you have to keep up with the cards. Yeah, and it's not going to be that much of an issue as long as you have these types of cards. And then quite often, you know, you feel like you've, you cross some kind of hurdle, you killed their Kindred Discovery, you wipe the board three times, and then they throw out some random five-color Wooburg nonsense like Eerie Ultimatum to get back every single dragon. And the problem with these types of cards that you will see as their opponent is that one of those dragons is probably going to be Scourge of Alcus or Terror of the Peaks, which just means you're dead. So if you let their build graveyard build up enough or they somehow put a bunch of cards in their hand into play, you're dead. So exile effects are really important, especially against these. I mean, I'm a really big a fan of Farewell, but... It just shows how important they are. Yeah, I don't know how unfun I can say Farewell is when it keeps stuff like this in check. It's like, do I really want to die to the Terror of the Peaks simultaneously entering with 30 other creatures again? Not really. But if you're sick of Terror of the Peaks and you don't ever want to play it again, you can go to Moxville.com and actually make sure you cut it from all your decks. I'm not advising that. That's just what I thought of saying. I love Moxfield because you can actually just choose the printing of the cards you want because BZ and I don't love the older borders. So we can always just choose the newer borders that we own and it'll just show up at that price and just reflect it really accurately. Yeah, it's hard for me when I'm scrolling through a deck and there's a bunch of random artworks that I've never seen before or they're like brand new. I really don't like the framing of like the 40k cards and the universes beyond stuff. So when I see like Talisman of Creativity, but it looks like a completely different magic card, I go, what the heck is going on? So the fact that you can choose what art is presented in your deck's visual view makes deck building so much easier. I don't have to go, huh? What? Secret layer? What is the, What is this? I, I don't know, but the box field, they, they got you back. Moving on to another unstoppable commander, Lyesa, Shroud of Dusk. Two white, white, black for a 5-5. Five, five. Rather than pay two for each previous time you've cast the spell from the command zone, you pay two life instead. Flying, lifelink, whenever a player casts a spell, they lose two life. This is going to be really dangerous. I mean, you're going to be getting the lifelink trigger off it when you swing, so you can just keep, that, keep your life total pretty high to pay that tax. And when people cast spells, they lose two life. I mean, there's people like BZ who just chain spells together like the baubles. They're just going to be getting pinged for two quite often. I can't beat this commander. If I see this commander, I go, I'm probably not going to win the game, like literally, because there's no way to keep it off. They're only going to pay five mana every time for the spell. The deck is built around the first ability of paying all this life to cast it uh, without paying tax. So they've got it covered. They're going to gain... 30 life in a game. They know how to do this. They're not going to cast 100 spells a turn. They've got like, you know, two, three important spells. They got don't have preordains in the deck. They don't have Mishra's Bauble like that, like I do. So they're built around every turn. Like it's been five on Lysa if she's dead. And then I start developing and playing more life gain and more hate pieces like what we're about to read. One of the pieces to help with life gain is Soul Warden. For a white, you get a 1-1. One, one. Whenever a creature enters the battlefield, you gain one life. That's going to stack up so quickly. Yeah, it just starts adding up, and it more than makes up for the life that you're going to lose from your own Lysa. They're going to lose from their Lysa, whoever has Lysa, whatever. And you're just going to start to feel like you're getting choked by this commander, and you don't feel like there's a lot of ways out because you can't stop it from coming down for five. Even if you keep playing a lot of little spells in your deck, in your Lysa deck, it won't matter because you're going to have so many 
life gain triggers that you'll either even out or still be ahead. Yeah, Cabal, Council of Allocation, you'll see this a lot. People love to double and triple up on these Lysa, I don't want to say stacks, but they're like hate bear, I don't know, a little like constrictor effects. Now when you cast a non-creature, you lose two because you cast a spell, and you lose two and they gain two because you cast a non-creature spell. And then you're just like, wait, four damage? I didn't even... What did I do, like, draw a card? I don't want that. I mean, death by a thousand cuts, right? It starts to add up after a while. And then that, that it contributes to the, like, I can't remove Lysa because now, what do you want to dig for answers? It's going to cost you, like, eight life to dig for an answer, and you might not even find one. But speaking of actual stacks pieces, Dranil Linvala is great in this deck. Yeah, opponents can't activate creature abilities, and Dranil Linvala actually gains them. So whether you need it as a mana dork, or you're going to use it like an Alapalani or whatever, really, you're just going to be getting all those effects, and everyone's going to try and remove that instead of Lysa. Yeah, and I think the flying starts to matter on these hate bear type effects, is because now you're just chipping in. And chipping in matters a lot more when opponents aren't really at 40, they're kind of at like 22. They're going to lose a lot of life just playing the game. And then Drana's Lava is like, oop, chip in, chip in, make a couple mana, I don't know, draw a card with some activated ability that they have. Cool beans. And another one of your favorites, don't build this deck, please. Uh, Blind <laughs> Obedience makes their stuff enter tapped, and it is extort so you can make up for the life you're losing as you cast spells, and they're going to gain life, and they're all profiting, and you're just like slowing them down even further, and they're just trying to like trudge through this like thick muck you're putting them in. Extort looks not that great on paper, I guess, because it's just like, oh, one mana and everyone loses one and you gain that much. It's, but it starts to add up, especially if you do have a little bit of mana left on your turns, like when you're, like when you're going to be casting one or two big spells because of Lyasa's tax effect. It's going to matter, and you're going to be able to gain that life back. Yeah, uh, Erebos, God of the Dead's a great, like, I don't want to say curve topper, but it's a great, like, punctuation mark, because now you go... You're constricted, you're restricted, you can't do that many things, and now you can't even recover from it because if you want to gain life, it just doesn't happen. He's indestructible, he's a source of card draw. If you want to pay more life, go for it. You have the life to spare. Gods are really scary in general, but I'd argue that Erebos is one of the scariest on the field. Yeah, I always feel like I'm, like especially in the mid-power games where you're not going to get comboed out and life totals matter, I always feel like I'm, I'm missing out and I'm like, Missing a little bit of a wrinkle that would help me win. Yeah, two mana and two life to draw a card to, that's incredibly powerful. That's not bad on a pretty good package deal already. So Erebos is sweet. I was debating putting one of the gods on this unstoppable list, uh, but we didn't. We have some other, like, I think more interesting picks, because they're obviously indestructible, can't be a creature, they're pretty good. Exquisite Blood is on this in this deck. You knew it was in this deck. They're gaining all this life, you're losing all this life. Exquisite Blood plus Lysa already says... It turns Lysa into like a cam ball, a super cam ball. And then, of course, you know they have Sanguine Blood. You know they do. And Sanguine Bond. And they're going to be out together, and they trigger each other infinitely to win. And if you're going to exile their Sanguine Bond, doesn't matter. They have Veto in there, too. You know they do. You know they have Veto. You know they have Veto, and you know they have Malakir Blood Witch, and you know they have, I don't know, that crappy 5-mana 4-4 four four from, like, M19. You know they got them all, and you're going to kill Exquisite Blood. What's the, what's the other, like... Time to die finisher. The time to die finisher is death, debt to the deathless. X, white, white, black, black. Each opponent loses twice X and you gain life equal to that life lost. And that's going to be such a big chunk at the end. You're only going to be hit for two if Lyasa's out and everyone's just going to die, basically. Yeah, the deck doesn't need to go bigger than this because you're going to fall to 15, 16 life just from trying to catch up and throw blockers in the way or remove Lysa or draw cards with your <laughs> crappy draw spells that don't feel so good anymore. I'd argue, too, in this deck, Painful Quandary. I think Painful Quandary is probably pretty good in this deck. It's just going to constrict them even more. Lysa is like a deck that just restricts all your resources so that you can't kill anything. You just feel like you can't take any action that's meaningful. For this next commander, it's unstoppable, and you're going to, as soon as I say it, you're going to go, oh, yeah. It's Feather the Redeemed. It's red, white, white for a 3-4 flyer. Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell that targets a creature you control, exile that card instead of putting it into your graveyard as it resolves. If you do, return it to your hand at the beginning of the next end step. So Feather decks are full of all these little rinky-dink combat tricks that, like, target a creature and maybe draw a card or give some minor ability. But when, like, those cards are bad, but when they never go away and you can cast them over and over and over and over... You just can't come out from under it. And what makes Feather so unstoppable is that some of these cards look like God's Willing. White for an instant. Target creature gains protection from a color of your choice until end of turn. Scry one. You've probably never seen that card in Commander outside of this deck, but it says if you're trying to remove her, which you really want to, boop, counter it basically. And then it goes away and then, oh, it comes right back. 
I don't know how you're supposed to beat that if you don't team up with people. And that's just one of their spells to stop you. I really like this because it lends a new flavor to Boros. Usually Boros is equipment and that sort of thing. So this is really fun. I also like the fact that you can build this out of maybe like draft chaff you have or build it really budget. Literally, yeah. <laughs> Another card that works really well in this is Psychotic Fury. Target multicolored creature gains double strike until end of turn and you draw a card. So obviously you're gonna give it to Feather and it's going to be chipping in for commander damage. And then you're gonna draw a card that's really, really cheap and it's just gonna go right back to your hand. Yeah, for two mana, you can't really beat that rate because they're gonna deal damage to them extra. And it's like, you're gonna be facing down Feather and you're gonna realize that there's a lot of pressure on you to remove it. Half of their deck is just God's willing protection spells so that you can't remove it. And then you're left with like, okay, well, what can I do? Is that you can make them sacrifice it and you can destroy all creatures or make or exile all creatures somehow. Don't worry, they still have answers to that, like Eerie Interlude, which is a mass uh, board wipe prevention, but it targets. So when your Interlude goes away, they get it back and all their creatures are safe for a whole turn and you have to figure out what else you're going to do. Now maybe you need to go ask the blue player to counter Eerie Interlude the next time they play it and hope they don't have anything else. Feather has an answer for everything and it's going to cheese you out. Like it will actually just cheese you out for like five or six turns in a row. Counter all your answers with their very cheap interaction. You don't you don't play enough interaction to stop all of their de defense. I think the big deal in this deck is if you can get them to discard their hand, that might really help you in the long run. Yeah, that's probably the way to go is just attack their hand so they can't rebuy God's Willing. <laughs> it's, it's a little like, it's funny because this is like the quintessential aggro deck. It's playing crappy, cheap cards that are going to temple you out and kill you. Yeah, but that commander damage is going to add up. They're all going to go back to your hand and I guess destroy the Reliquary Tower if they have it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, definitely hit the Reliquary Towers. They're going to have something like that we'll get to. But Explosive Entry is a random card you're going to see. It destroys target artifact, but also randomly says put counter on target creature so they can use this as removal to sort of rebuy it turn after turn. And it's like not a good rate when you use it once. Illuminator Virtuoso is another great one because when you target with a spell, it's going to connive. So you're going to be able to filter out cards that you don't need and just get those instants and sorceries that you want. It's like another backup feather. It can do things if you don't have feather because this is going to get huge and you still have ways to protect it and force through damage. But with feather out, obviously this thing is unstoppable and you're going to be worried about this even more than feather because feather, it's going to be an 8-8 double strike. But it's Boros and you're wondering, there's no like ramp, how am I going to get there? Goldspan Dragon, another great way to do it because it's going to make treasures and treasures give you extra mana. It's going to tap for two instead of one. I mean, this thing is like silly in this deck. You can dump your entire hand, throw out Defiant Strike, plus one, plus oh, draw a card, whatever. Throw out something else, target it, draw a card, whatever. Expedite, give it haste. Making treasures every single time you target it, all your spells are going to cost one or two. So it lets you spend in your entire hand and then keep a bunch of treasures after that. When you profit mana on it, you get through combat damage. Feather hits like a truck again. They can't answer it because you're they're out of removal and you've got three more ways to protect it. And Feather puts it back to your hand at the end step. So next turn, you can target Goldspan Dragon with all your stuff again, get all the treasures again, and then get it back to your hand again. You're going to keep all that mana up so that if they try and remove it or something, you're going to have the flicker spell. You're going to have, you know, the target. They're, you're going to have whatever you need. Yeah, there's if they see Goldspan Dragon and we can't kill it, in like half a turn, I would probably concede to this, honestly. It's, it's really tough to stop when they have all the cards we just talked about. Next is a card that I think is really funny and good in this deck, Spellbook. It's just zero mana. You have no max hand size. So when you draw all this stuff, it doesn't really help that your entire hand recurs if you can't keep it all and keep that vast like utility belt of options. So Spellbook is just like a crappy little way to go, boop, there it is. I mean, it's cheap, it's really easy to use. And the fact is, I actually had it in my Jekyll Hyde deck at one point, it was, it was pretty useful. What is your Jekyll Hyde deck for those who don't know? My Jekyll Hyde deck is the duality of drawing cards. It's a little bit of mill, a little bit of drawing and everyone hurts because I'm making you draw extra, extra cards. And I don't know, BZ got milled out with it once and it I, was really funny. I did, don't forget Spellbook. Spellbook does exist, some decks do want it. The next one, of course, it's a nitpicking nerds list. You know that BZ's favorite is going to be on here. Carador Ghost Chieftain. Five and abs in for a 3-4, but it costs one less for each creature card in your graveyard. Once during each of your turns, you can cast one creature from your graveyard. So this is going to be milling yourself out, and you're going to be landing so many creatures in there. It's going to negate the commander tax, and you're just going to be casting it for like abs in every time. Really hard to keep Carador off the board, and it's really hard to keep whatever creature they want most off the board because Carador is going to come down for three mana because they're filling their graveyard constantly, then whatever creature you don't want to see is going to come down. And it's just going to keep going, and they're going to slowly but surely grind you out of the game 
and you're going to be left with no cards and like losing to random chaff if that's what it, if that's what it comes down to or they'll have some kind of big finish but you're going to see things like Sayer wayfinder this is like to me the quintessential character card because it's a creature it's cheap it's got a stupid etv that puts cards in your graveyard it put, looks at the top four takes a land helps you hit land drops and then the rest go into the bin for character to use as food later it, it basically makes your graveyard your second hand and that's going to be unstoppable in the long game yeah because when you're milling so much it doesn't matter what ends up in there because they're either going to bring it back and you can exile the graveyard it's going to be more he's just going to cast like a mana or like a mana dork that ramps a little bit from his graveyard if that's all he has because that's still value yeah even if you exile the yard and carador is out you can just start casting random stuff like Seder wayfinder you can rebuild pretty easily you don't this deck does not fold to one graveyard hate uh burst effect you gotta keep up with it another creature in this deck that provides so much value is plague crafter when it enters each player sacks a creature or planeswalker and each player who didn't discards a card and obviously they're gonna keep recurring it plague crafter eats three and four mana uh, commanders for breakfast and it just gets you such a huge tempo advantage and it lets you put a card that you want in the graveyard into the graveyard you're just like oh yeah, I guess I would rather he just be dead. Sorry, buddy. I'll see you later. And everybody else can sacrifice the creature that they paid resources for that hasn't paid them off yet. That is really the second hand that we're talking about. Another one of my all-time favorite cards is Gris the Hunger Tide. It's a planeswalker. It can mill you, make insects, uh, sacrifice creatures to destroy creatures. And in the late game, if you plus it enough, each opponent can lose life equal to the number of creature cards in your graveyard, which is a win condition, honestly. But I like that it's consistent removal for three mana. You just have to sacrifice another creature, which you probably have. And Carador can recast it, even though it's a Planeswalker, because it says it's a creature in other zones. That is really cool, honestly. The fact that it is a creature, I wouldn't expect that to be stapled onto a Planeswalker. It never has been before, and it probably never will be again, but it's super cool. But you're going to want to fill up your graveyard with your own creatures so you can keep recasting them and keep getting those ETBs. Altar of Dementia, a great way to do it. You can sack a creature and target player yourself. Mills cards equal to the sacrificed creature's power. So you're just going to keep filling up that graveyard and you're going to be putting the creatures you want into the graveyard so you can cast them again. This card literally does everything you could ever want because it is a way to put your creatures that are on the board into your graveyard, the creatures in your deck into the graveyard, which are all things you want. And then in the late game, when you have enough creatures in play, it kills your opponents because it mills them. I mean, I cannot possibly, at two mana, on a free sack, I'll ask for anything better. I also have another one of my favorites, Spore Frog. It's very, it's more of a low power card, but it can still lock people out of the game because it's a, fo a frog that sacrifices to fog. It's the fog frog. And that you can go, play Spore Frog, pass. Now, whoever monsters up enough attack power to kill you, you can say, nope. Fog for the turn. Now, if no one else can kill you, you get to untap, cast it again with character right from the graveyard and just go, your move and continue to develop your board because you only spent one mana. It is so rough to kill this. I've watched games go for three, four, five turns longer than they should because he get, keeps just bringing back Spore Frog. And then I win in the end or something because they can't stop it. And it puts such a hurdle for them to clear for just one mana each turn that I can develop and attack them and kill their other creatures. And they're just left going, Spore Frog, huh? <laughs> Uh, kill Carador? Nope, they'll just recast it. Exile their graveyard? Nope, Spore Frog's in play. They'll just recast it after they fall. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. BZ's favorite cards deck in his Carador deck is just like mediocre beat down the deck. It will just beat you down because the deck has no win condition because it's just my favorite cards. And Spore Frog is, of course, in there. Revelark is another card I think of. Five mana, four, three, when it dies, you get creatures back and it can create infinite loops with Karma Guide and Safi Eric's Daughter. Or it can just get you value and get back a Viscera Seer so you can start sacrificing other creatures. And you can evoke it from the graveyard with Carador. It just does everything. It really just does a little bit of everything. That is a lot of value, honestly, because you're running so many little weenies in here to get Carador on like the field and stuff. And so you can keep recasting them easily. So you're going to be able to just bring back so much. Yeah, it's another way to also like mitigate graveyard hate because if you have a Revel Arc sitting in play and they try to nuke your graveyard, you can get back your two most important small creatures like right away. But when your graveyard is filled up, what do you do then? Well, you can use something like Living Death. Each player exiles all creature cards from the graveyard, then sacrifice all creatures they control, then put all the cards they exile this way onto the battlefield. So basically, Basically, your graveyard is just going to be on the field now. All at once. And everybody gets to do that, but you're just going to bring the hammer down. The turn is over. The game is over with your turn. You are going to be playing some kind of gray merchant or some kind of like blood artist effect. You're going to get 50 creatures into play. Everyone else gets like six. Good for them. They're dead. You're, oh, you countered my crater hoof? Don't worry. I'll <laughs> he'll bring be you back. back. <laughs> he'll be back on Christmas Day. Although with no, I guess he'll just be a big hasty lone attacker. He's just a big boy. He's a big boy. We don't need Crater Hoof to win. We just puke our whole graveyard into play. That's why I love Carador, because if you let him go for too long and you don't interact enough, they just 
punch you out with a giant haymaker, but they can also go toe-to-toe -to -toe with you, turn after turn, and just one-for-one -one you until you lose. Next up, we got a pretty new commander, but oh my god, this thing hits really hard. It's Sauron, the Dark Lord. Three blue, black, red for a 7-6 with Ward. Sacrifice a legendary artifact or a legendary creature. Yeah, good luck with that. Whenever an opponent casts a spell, a mass orcs one. Whenever an army you control deals combat damage to a player, the ring tempts you, which doesn't seem like much, but wait. Whenever the ring tempts you, you can discard your hand and draw four cards. So this thing, if left on in play, generates a million orcs or a one orc that is very huge if you can't sacrifice them and starts drawing you cards and discarding your hand and drawing a bunch of things. And if they want to kill it, it's just going to cost like their best creature. Even if you're playing in a battle cruiser meta and you're only casting one spell per turn, uh, it doesn't, it still it really starts to add up with the orcs. And when the ring tempts you, if you play all of your spells, you go, okay, discard my empty hand, draw four. That's, I'd love to. That's a plan, which just means this encourages a bunch of cheap cards, a bunch of efficient counter spells and removal and stuff. And the first card that we have here that I want to talk about is friggin' Demir Signet. Because I just think Sauron's so powerful. You just want to get him in play. Because once he's in play, he kind of takes over the game by himself, even if you can't protect him. Because he kind of protects himself. They don't, no one wants to like ruin their own game plan and set themselves back three turns just to answer your commander. And then he gets stuck in play. And then they're like, crap, what am I supposed to do? So you just want to play like 10 of these rinky dink mana rocks, even at two mana. I wasn't going to say, ooh, play Jeweled Lotus. Play up like 10 two mana rocks and just get them out on turn four. You can also get tempted by the ring a little bit earlier in the game with Call of the Ring or better Phyrexian Arena. When black at the beginning of your upkeep, the ring tempts you. Whenever you choose a creature as your ring bearer, you can pay two life if you do draw a card. Yeah, so this lets you on your upkeep with Sauron out, discard your hand, draw four, then you draw a card for your turn and that doesn't feel too bad. I don't that, that's pretty great if you were looking for a removal or a counter spell or like just another way to like put pressure on and you don't have that definitely discard your hand and draw four i mean the ring tempting you is also a pretty good effect there's like tiers of it but you can choose other creatures and you can kind of move it around i i think it's really good it does it does actually also make creatures legendary that's true which might matter for things like ring sight which is three mana for a ring tempt and then you search for a creature then you search for a card that shares a color with a legendary creature you control, which you just made with ring tempting you. And then you reveal it, put it into your hand and shuffle. So this is just a tutor. If, jeez, oh if my opponent plays Sauron, passes the turn, us as a table can't remove it for a turn cycle, and then they play ring sight, I might be done. I don't know. That's, that's, good luck coming back from that. That's a powerful tutor. Like, you're going to get your best thing, and you're probably just going to win right on the spot. It's Grim Tutor, but like, first, if you want, you can draw four cards or discard your hand and draw four. Oh, sounds awful. Yeah, oh, well, I guess I'll play that card, <laughs> I suppose. Another really sneakily good card with this deck is Goblin Bombardment. Sack a creature, deal one. You don't need to play any sack outlets or any uh, sack fodder in your deck. Sauron's got it. It now says. Whenever an opponent casts a spell, you deal one damage to any target because you're just going to keep making a new 1-1 one, one orc every time and sacking it before you get a counter on it. That really helps like with the payoff because it's really awesome to have like a 20-20 orc on the field or whatever. Yeah. But if it's getting chumped or something, it's not that great. So you want to get utility with the creatures that you're making. Yeah, over that same amount of time, you could have dealt 20 damage with Goblin Barbarian. That's way better. That's just going to stop them from, from, doing, from being able to do anything. Like... Uh, even if they're trying to get value out of their commander, you can start killing their commanders aggressively because you know they're going to need a legendary artifact or a creature to stop Sauron. So if you just snipe everyone's commander as soon as it comes out, I don't know what they're supposed to do. But Sauron, of course, not only does he have making creatures, he has ward, he also just has great stats. 7-6, <laughs> he's not going to die to your Toxic Deluge. Toxic Deluge is pretty perfect because it's going to leave Sauron in play. Minus 5, minus 5 kills most things. And your orc army, if you're going vertically and growing it into like a 10 10 is also not going to die so you can sweep all the creatures out hit with your could even be 25 25 hit for 20 damage because you shrunk everything by five and just kill people i love toxic deluge it's a really great board wipe i know i'm usually really big on the exile effects but toxic deluge is just kind of a catch-all and life doesn't matter as much in commander because we start with so much of it and when you have the biggest creatures in play like with sauron and a giant orc army it's even more appealing for like aggro <laughs> just to beat people down. Of course, uh, one of the biggest feel bads you could possibly arrange with Sauron is for somebody to go, okay, they're like all beat up. They're like emerging from the ash and they're like, I got the kill spell guys. Sack my five mana commander, target your Sauron with like a doom blade. And you just go, okay, war trigger. And they're like, sack my commander. And then you're like, okay, an offer you can't refuse. I think people should play offer you can't refuse way more because uh, 
most spells that you want to counter are non-creature because it's usually like, oh, the thing the thing that's countering your spell or it's the kill spell. And, you know, you want to protect your stuff. And two, two treasure tokens given to one person for one mana to counter a spell, that's so good. Yeah, it, it really is a card that's going up on my radar. We all knew this was card was at least good, but I think it's pretty great. Swan Song hits instant sorceries and enchantments. Offer You Can't Refuse hits instant sorceries, enchantments, and artifacts, as long as they're not creatures. And it gives out two treasures, which is better. I'd rather get two treasures than a bird, but it hits more things. So it's like a give and take. It's a really efficient card. And these types of things are going to just absolutely demoralize people when they actually pay the impossible cost and they sacrifice their commander and their commander's like, hope it was worth it. And then you go, no, it wasn't. They're not going to have the legendary creature that they want to sack because Besides from you, they're probably not going to be running the ring tempts you effects. So they can't just make, you know, the 1-1 one, one dork a legendary creature. Yeah, and even if they try, you can start gobble bombarding them out then away. We also have the Black Gate. If you're going to grow a giant orc army, why not make it unblockable and take out the person with the most life? I really like this card. I put it in Rowan recently because it does lose, you do lose life if you'd like to. But I like the fact that you have the option. The next commander is one of the big bads, the boogeyman of the older days. Drevi Imperial Tactician, green, white, and blue for a 2-3 flyer. When it enters the battlefield or a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, you can tap or untap target permanent. And it cheats out the commander tax because if you pay one and bant, you could put it onto the battlefield from the command zone. How are you supposed to kill this card when there is A, no commander tax, and B, it's not even cast from the command zone. It just comes out. It just... Whoop, there it is. You can't counter it. This is just really rough too because it says target permanent, not just like non-land permanent. So it's like, okay, tap all your lands if you can get enough stuff. Yeah, going. you can tap lands. It can instant speed mess you up. And also when you flash to Revy in, it can untap one of your lands. So it really only costs three to flash in if you want to use it like proactively on your own stuff. And it just is, it's really tough. They're going to start tapping and untapping and fiddling with everything. And you're like, stop touching my cards. And they won't stop touching your cards. And you're not going to be able to keep Drevi off the field for like more than two seconds. And they're going to play things like Ectopia Sprawl, which is perfect because it enchants a forest. Now it makes extra mana. And then Drevi can just, when all your creatures hit, you can say untap my forest that has Utopia Sprawl on it like six times. And then you can make mana before each trigger resolves. Then cast some giant instant and draw or draw a million cards or do a bunch of something. You know the Derevi player is also going to be playing like the Triobe and then, you know, the shock lands that also count as forests. They're probably not going to be playing as many basics. So, but it still won't matter because they'll be able to find those forests to enchant. The deck's also full of evasive flyers because you want to hit with a bunch of things with the Revy so you can get a bunch of untapped triggers or tap triggers. So we're going to throw like Ledger Shredder in. It's just going to connive over the course of the game, slowly get bigger, and have flying, which is relevant because we're going to trigger Drevi. We love the card selection and the fact that it's just going to grow like crazy. I feel like Ledger Shredder does not get killed as fast as it ever needs to. And even if people know, they're like, ooh, Ledger Shredder, that's pretty good. Eh, it's a 1-3. Yeah. Eh, can I have twice? Whatever. Eh, can I have six more times? Okay. It's such a good blocker, too. 1-3 is like pretty good stats. And honestly, it becomes a 2-4 almost immediately most of the time. So even better than that. Yeah. Also, you're going to see Ava Mind Sensor. It's 2-1. It's got Flash. It's got our favorite flying. It's even a bird. Uh, so you can... I, I've seen some Derevi bird decks. That's pretty funny, honestly. But it's just going to like start taxing your opponents. Kind of like a Lysis type thing. It's like, oh, if you would search, instead your search sucks. It's really rough, too because you're going to be cracking things. You're like, just cause you don't have demonic tutor and stuff doesn't mean you don't have fetch lands or like a terramorphic expanse. It goes, okay, look at the top four instead. No one is safe. <laughs> no power level is safe from the even mind sensor search. Yeah, they're gonna they're gonna restrict your ability to like take special actions like search and, and attack. And they're gonna just keep your best things tapped down, keep their best things untapped, generate a bunch of mana, shut you out of the game sometimes. What about the next one? The next one, Verity Circle. When a creature an opponent controls becomes tapped, if it isn't be being declared as attacker, you could draw a card. So obviously you're going to be using Derevi's triggers to tap their creatures. Okay, they can't swing at you now. They can't block your stuff and you draw a card. Amazing. I mean, it's like build your own, you know, Toski kind of thing of like, oh, well, all right, I guess I'll just draw a bunch of cards and shut down your blockers for like other people. I'm sure there's a Derevi deck that wants to goad stuff too. And then now that you've tapped everybody's blockers, they're going to go, well, I'm goaded. I might as well hit the player who's defenseless. A lot of different ways you can go, and they're all kind of nasty. I also like Hilda of the Icy Crown, brand new card, but it triggers when you tap untap creatures opponents control. So you either make a 4-4, put a counter on each creature you control, or scry to then draw a card. I love the fact that we are getting Derevi tech in the year of 2023. <laughs> year, I never thought year I'd of see our it. Lord. Yeah. <laughs> 
but it's really versatile. I, I love it. Yeah, you can use Hilda to beat down, draw cards, or advance your board. I can't really think of anything else I'd want to do. Maybe it doesn't kill a creature, but you're already tapping the creatures. So if it was combat only usefulness, then there's no way to, to stop it. I feel like some of these decks are canceling each other out. Like Lysa dunks on the Feather deck, but then the Derevi deck dunks on like the Galta deck. It's like you're never attacking with Galta, ever. I mean, isn't that the Rock, Paper, Scissors of Commander? It's right? the Rock, like... Paper, Scissors of the Unstoppable Commanders. We also have, if you don't want to use very circle to draw cards. You can use Orin Frostfang, which just says when your creatures hit, which you're trying to do anyway, you draw a card. And now they have death touch, so they're even more annoying. But the biggest salt score on this list is stasis. Players skip their own tap steps, but that doesn't matter to the player who has Derevi because they're just gonna untap their stuff anyways. Yeah, it's it's honestly, however bad you're thinking it is, it's way worse than that. Stasis is gonna come down, right? They only spent two mana, great. They have, let's say five flying creatures. Most of the opponents are probably tapped out because you cast spells during your turn. But you're like, oh, well, I still have a few lands untapped. I'll just remove your Revy or remove the stasis when I go. No, no, hold on. This is their combat step. They're going to hit you with all five of their creatures. They're going to tap all of your untapped lands. Then you're going to go, well, I really don't get a turn at all now, do I? And then, Or you know, if they have leftovers, they're going to untap their lands. So that stasis never goes away, and you're really just soft-locked out of the game. You know, it's not like Mystic Remora where you have the cumulative upkeep. It's just one blue. They're going to keep paying it. It's never going to go away, yeah. minus like an actual board wipe for enchantments or targeted removal. Yeah, we had to throw at least one super mega salty card for Derevi because Derevi used to be one of the most hated commanders, which is fair because it doesn't, it's not even like a commander. It's just a emblem that you have. It just says create Derevi over and over. <laughs> so this was our seven most unstoppable commanders. If you're looking for the seven most hated commanders, which Derevi may have qualified for in 2015, you can check out that video right here. What is our thought of the day? Eat your vegetables.